Hey everyone, my name's Jad, and I read Zoe by J.D. Salinger so that you don't have to. In this video, I'm going to refer back to the other story that I recently reviewed by J.D. Salinger, which was Franny. And this is the book, or this is the copy that I'm currently reading from. Uh, I really enjoyed Franny, and uh, Zoe is, I'd say, four times longer uh, than Franny. It is an excellent story, however, and uh, even though, uh, you know, 30 pages for Franny, I'd say 120 pages for Zoe or, or so, something along those lines, um, incredible wrap-up. I mean, it just really, they work so well together. Um, Zoe on its own um, is, is incredible with Franny. Reading them together, reading them right after each other um, is a, a treat. They are incredible stories, um, and I highly recommend that you pick them up. If you uh, want to get a sense of the you know, writer's voice, you don't have enough time to read Catcher in the Rye, uh, but you want to get a sense of J.D. Salinger and the, the themes that he writes about, or the topics that he discusses, or the style that he uses, this is a great place to start. Um, these were both written before and published before uh, Catcher in the Rye. Um, I'll break it down real quick, and then I'll hit on some main points. I'll give you the who, what, where, when, and why. Uh, this story is a little bit more complicated, so I'll go into a little bit more detail and I'll break this video into three different parts, but hopefully it won't break the 30 minute mark. Who is this story about? Well, that's a great question. <laughs> it's about Zoe or, you know, Zachary, that's his real name, uh, Glass. And this is what was considered the Glass family stories. Um, just like the last story was about Franny, Franny Glass or Francis Glass. Franny is Zoe's sister, the youngest child of the Glass family. But the story is primarily based on Zoe and based on the relationship that they have that, or that Zoe has with his younger sister, Franny. What is this story? Well, it's a short story, but it dips into many different types of genres and writing styles. So I'd say it's a short story. Together, they kind of function as a novella. And it also has aspects of plays, or styles of, you know, the type of dialogue that you might uh, read in, a, in an actual play, especially since there are actual references to plays, uh, not only real plays, but also, um, you know, fictional television plays that are made for the purposes of the story. Where is this story based? Manhattan, in New York City. But it also takes place in multiple other uh, locations, whether uh, micro locations or, or sort of macro locations like around the world, for example. Uh, we have one of the characters that goes to Japan, one of them that makes a reference to South Dakota. Um, but for the uh, main purpose of the story, it's Manhattan, particularly the glass house. <laughs> and I love how this is like a very interesting reference when we're thinking of the, the metaphorical and uh, metaphorical significance of what a glass house uh, means, since the glass is also the name of the family. Um, when is the story based? Very specifically, it's 1955. But you could also say that it's after World War II. Um, the specific date is Monday. November at 10.30 a.m. They give you this very specific time and date when they're setting up the story, or, or J.D. Salinger's narrator does, because they want you, uh, in my opinion, they want you to consider this time and the context of this, this moment in, refer, in regards to, you know, how Zoe is behaving and what he's doing and his routine as we, as we experience him at the beginning, what his mother is doing, what Francis is doing, or Franny, and how they're sort of, you know, 
getting together and, and having their heart-to-heart -heart conversation, which is the whole point of the story. And then let me hit on that right now before I clean this up. Why? Well, there's multiple reasons why this story is written, but it is, in my idea, it's a psychological story. Um, it's a philosophical story. It's a literary story. We could call it literary fiction. You know, in today's language, we might use that word. Uh, we could also say that it's uh, metafictional, since it refers to other literary texts. It refers to itself uh, partially. It is a story with many other sub-stories contained within it. Um, and it's a story that refers to another story itself, which is Franny. Um, so when we think of that as Franny and Zoe, they function as a pair, but they also function as, as one story told with two, from two perspectives or with two sides. Um, the important thing to consider also when we're thinking about the narrator or the perspective of this story, it is third person. Uh, and the narrator is omniscient. And unlike other story, the other story, Franny, there is a footnote. And there is, you know, uh, a lot of what I would consider stage direction. Since we have the characters moving throughout the, the house, the glass house, uh, the characters moving from, you know, sitting positions to laying down positions, uh, moving and holding different objects in different hands at different times. Um, these are uh, very important things to consider when you're reading the story, but also for visual reference. Uh, it, let's say if this were a play, it would be very important to have this type of direction. In a short story, it's not there for nothing. So we have to consider it when you're reading the story. Uh, I'm going to clean this uh, blackboard up and I'll go into uh, some of the themes and some of the important symbol uh, symbolic references that J.D. Salinger makes in the story, as well as I'll cut the story into different parts uh, in case you want to get a sense of beginning, middle, and end. All right, for this part, I've uh, cut it into three parts, and, you know, some people perhaps might not agree with how I've uh, decided to cut up the chronology of the story, but I think that this works for a very logical purpose um, if we're looking at it from one perspective, from Zoe's perspective. Part one, Zoe is alone in the bathtub. And we might think, okay, he's in the bathtub, what's the point? Well, we sort of uh, come to him in this initial stage of the story where he's reading a letter by his, uh, written by his brother, and he's also reading a, a manuscript for a play. Uh, this is important because we get a sense of in, in my opinion, what J.D. Salinger wants us to do is to observe how uh, Zoe is, is, you know, viewing himself in relationship to his brother, viewing himself in the relationship to, you know, his own you know, mental processes on his own in a sort of a, a quiet area in a room that he can sort of be himself, in this case, literally naked, alone in the room. Um, he's in exposed uh, circumstance. And again, it's a beautiful thing that J.D. Salander does is where he, he, can, he connects these uh, physical and literal symbols together. Um, he's reflective. And this also works a little bit later when he's actually reflecting. Uh, his, his image is being reflected in a mirror while his mother stands behind him. Uh, it's a very interesting idea uh, to consider who he is as a character. Um, he's alone in the bathtub. He's reading. Um, this then changes during part two, which I would uh, I would say is like an, a real part two because we start to see his mother uh, enter the bathroom. So Bessie, or his mother, enters and starts talking to him. And I mean, you know, this is a very interesting family dynamic that they would have where the mother enters the bathroom while her, you know, 25-year-old son is bathing or not bathing. You know, he's just kind of sitting there wallowing in his... <laughs> in, you know, room temperature water at this point, reading letters that are four years old. 
um, they start having a conversation about many things, but primarily about Franny and the mental uh, the, the mental breakdown that she had in the previous story that we read. Um, this then moves where he's uh, no longer in the bathtub, but he you know gets up and starts shaving. Uh, so I'll say Zoe shaves and talks to Bessie. Um, but he doesn't really look at her. He's actually only looking at the mirror. So it's this really quite interesting uh, allusion to not only just uh, the story of, uh, you know, a, a Medusa-like story <laughs> where you can't really face your mother or you can't really, like, look at a woman in, in it. In her face, it's also that illusion, and I'm, I'm totally blanking on the Greek and uh, the Greek allusion to this one. But you know, not looking back, uh, turning around, and then she turns to uh, as she goes back to Hades. I I'm so sorry that I'm forgetting this, this one, um, Euripides. I I'm totally blanking, and it's also that uh, another biblical allusion to turning around, and uh, you know, the woman turns to salt again. I'm totally blanking because I uh, didn't really get a lot of sleep last night. But these are very interesting um, literary and canonical allusions here. Um, that's part two. And then part three lasts a lot longer. And, you know, this is where part three could really be cut into multiple parts to part four and part five. But part three is where Zoe exits. Oops. bathroom. He enters living room where Franny is. And that's when he starts to have that long talk with Franny. Now, this part is split, and again, like I said, it could be split because he talks to Franny in multiple ways. At first, he's talking to Franny face-to-face -face while she's laying down on the couch, and then another part is when he actually exits the room, since he's upset her. He walks off, he uh, walks through the house, through his old siblings' bedrooms, and then proceeds to call her on the phone and continue the conversation, taking a new persona, pretending to be his brother. So... This is not only just interesting that I'll talk about in a second for thematic purposes, but um, I'll write down here, face to face, and then phone call, where, you know, uh, Zoe puts on a different persona, he pretends to be someone he's not, but still is using that person as a mouthpiece. He's still saying the things that he wants to say. He's still being truthful, whether or not he's putting on a, a different persona. Um, it's a very beautiful thing that uh, that J.D. Salinger does through this story. And then to also hit on that point where we can see like a change in persona. This is what happens at the beginning where... You know, uh, Zoe is, you know, shaving, getting dressed. It's subtle, but you can see that there's a character change that is occurring while he's putting on his clothes, while he's, you know, cleaning himself up. And right here, I've just said, you know, the clothes and the, the dress, what he's wearing adds to his character and makes him into someone else, makes him into Zoe, makes him into Zachary, you know, this character that we are now starting to get a, a full, complete picture of. Uh, that's it for this part. I'm just going to erase this one more time and hit on the main themes, and then that'll be the end of the video. I'm going to talk about uh, right now the characters because there are, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty big family, the Glass family. So here we go. 
All right, these are the two next parts that I'm going to be discussing. First of all, it's characters, and then second of all, it's movement. For characters, we know that there are seven children, and from, you know, oldest to youngest, we have Seymour, Buddy, Boo Boo, <laughs> still not exactly too sure about that name, but there's a lot of these names, you know. Uh, Zoe, for example, has that double O, but, you know, uh, didn't really, I think it's a little over my head. There's a lot that I'm not going to discuss also in this video about the story, about the literary themes, or about um, other types of symbols, uh, particularly about the kids and their sort of fame, or their sort of uh, reputation as, as childhood starlings or stars, um, because that could take also uh, quite a long time. I'm mainly just hitting on the, the major themes and uh, doing a quick breakdown. After Boo Boo, we have the twins, Walt and Walker. And then finally we have the star of the show, Zachary and Francis or Franny. Now, important to know that Seymour is dead as well as Walt. Seymour committed suicide, whereas Walt died in Japan in the war. Buddy is a writer and a recluse. And uh, in this case, Zoe is an actor and Franny is a college student. These are the most important characters of the story, the ones that I've highlighted in blue right there. Um, the ages range uh, quite dramatically. If we think that Franny, in this case, might be, you know, let's be generous and say that she's 20. We know that Zoe is 25. In this case, there is actually a reference to the to the age of Seymour, but I don't have it right in front of me, so I don't want to write down something that might not be true. Um, these are the characters, the primary ones. I'm just going to underline again in blue. Franny, oh sorry, in yellow, Zoe, Seymour, and Buddy. For the next section, we have the movement in the story. And like I said, movement refers to location and where this story is based. Um, for the purpose of this video, there are specific places that these characters go, particularly if we're following Zoe, we would say that the story is in Manhattan, but more specifically, it's in their apartment. Oh, sorry, I'll just say the glass house. Particularly, it's in the bathroom. Then it moves from the bathtub to the sink. It goes to the living room, where Franny is. It goes to Walt and Walker's bedroom. Then it goes to the parents' bedroom, Bessie and Les. Then it goes to, I know there's quite a few bedrooms, goes back to the living room. And uh, that is that is sort of where it, where it leaves us. If we think then uh, the, the sheer size of this house, we can imagine that it is a big house. If we're thinking about a house in Manhattan, whether it's an apartment, whether it's in, in an upscale uh, upscale neighborhood, uh, whether it's in the 50s or not, they definitely have money and they have a lot of space to go. Now, if we also want to talk about the house in more detail, we know that it's being painted. This is going to be important for the themes. The house is being renovated. Oops. In, in, in a way. The house is being cleaned. And it's being protected from getting dirty because there is newspaper all over the floor. Now, that's important because a lot of what we have seen so far is, you know, the bathroom, 
things are going from changing states, clean to dirty. Thing people are, you know, cleaning their, you know, getting things off of their chest. In this case, they're like cleaning the slate. Um, there's a lot of this sort of symbolic reference to that. In this part, I'm just going to turn that off and open this layer up. That was pretty cool, huh? See, I'm getting, I'm getting used to getting, getting the hang of this stuff. Uh, there are a few themes here that I'll just go into a little bit more detail in now, since we're discussing this idea of the house, about how it's being cleaned, etc. We have, first of all, reading. There's multiple different types of reading in this story. Oops. Here we go. There is the reading of people and their voices and their, you know, physicalities. There's the reading of personal letters and journals. There's the reading of scripts. Uh, these are quite interesting because when we're thinking about who is doing this, it's Zoe. And Zoe, in this case, is reading not just, you know, passively or uh, just for fun. He's reading because he's studying roles. In this case, we know that Zoe is an actor. He is responding as such. He's not just responding as a brother or a member of a family. He's trying to think, what's the correct thing to say here? What would this character say here? What would Zoe say? What would Seymour say? What would Buddy say? What would his mother re respond? What would, uh, you know, he's trying to also project, you know, what does Franny know? What does she expect me to say? Does she, ex does she expect this, this to be uh, hurtful or harmful? He's quite self-aware uh, about the roles that he's playing. And this is quite uh, that, that sort of meta aspect of the story, even though he also is inhabiting that, that the role of himself, you know, which is something that when we talk a little bit about being disillusioned or disenchanted by certain things within this story and within Franny, um, it's a beautiful idea when we think about character exploration and J.D. Salinger's writing ability for this. It's, it's quite remarkable. The second aspect is literary references. There are numerous, just to hit on some big ones, Kafka, which at this stage, you know, very interesting, very hot topic um, during the 50s and 60s. Shakespeare, of course, but also multiple other writers that are fictional and real. We have, you know, other forms such as the canon, which we would say is the religious doctrines that are Western and Eastern. This is hugely important to the way that Franny views the world and for the way that Zoe is able to communicate with her by referencing, you know, not only the Bible, but Eastern texts such as the Bhagavad Gita, such as um, stories about the Buddha, stories about um, the connection between East and West, uh, hugely interesting. Again, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it because it could end up taking way too much time. The next section is the house. I'll try to go a little bit more, uh, a little bit faster through this. The house is being painted. The house is being painted, but that's not only that's not the only thing that's being sort of covered in something. We can see that in this case, uh, Zoe is perspiring. But he's also covered in water and sweat. This is quite similar to what Franny was in the first story. Franny was sweating profusely in the first story. And in that case, Lane was very aware that Franny was sweating. In this story about Zoe, his mother, Bessie, is very aware that he was perspiring while talking to Franny. And that's because it's a very stressful conversation that they're having. And we can see that just like an actor on the stage, Zoe would be really pushing himself. He would be trying quite hard to say the right things. It's also covered in other things, not just paint, newspaper. And that could have, you know, multiple significant uh, points talking about, you know, context and other allusions 
to historical events or to, you know, cultural icons that come up. Again, I won't talk about that too deeply. The food and drink in this story, we have chicken broth that Zoe's mother wants to, uh, Franny's mother wants to feed her. This is a direct reference to the chicken sandwich from the last story. She still won't eat. And that's because we can definitely understand in the story more clearly than before, making a lot of assumptions in Franny that she does have a perhaps an eating disorder. She is psychologically affected by this existential crisis or this crisis of self that she's incur that she's uh, encountering. Um, we also have drinking, in this case, drinking in two different ways, alcohol. We have the I'll say the blood of Christ. Because there's so much reference to Jesus Christ and to religion, uh, but we also have the social aspect of social drinking and meeting someone for a drink, something that Zoe doesn't necessarily want to do, but he knows that it's sort of a custom and he has to do it if he wants to continue to be seen and connect with these uh, influential people or these writers, whether he wants to or not. It's something that he just has to do and something that he refers to, uh, that he mentions to uh, to Franny a lot. It's like, you just have to do certain things. You have to wake up and you have to you know, acknowledge that this is life. Movement, like I've said before in the previous slide, in the previous uh, little page that I discussed, but movement in a sort of macro way, a larger way. We have Franny coming home from college. And that's quite interesting. We have Franny's uh, other move, you know, because she feels a little safer coming home. Uh, safer, yet also the center of attention as being the young child, the baby of the family, as she's referred to. We also have the movement from her, from her seated positions. Because we know that she's on the couch the entire, most of the time throughout the story, but, you know, she's sitting on the couch with the cat, she's sitting on the couch face down, she's sitting on, she's lying down on the couch face up, we have this word that J.D. Salinger uses, prostrate, which is also these other interesting religious-themed words, just like when we have the bathroom here. Sorry, I'm just going to jump to a different part because Zoe uses the word ablutions, which, you know, it's sort of a religious way of describing cleaning oneself for specific purposes. Uh, great references that J.D. Salinger uses here. That's all I have for, for movement, particularly, you know, when you know, the positions that she's facing. And like I mentioned before, it's this movement of stage direction. Uh, in terms of names, there are multiple names for these characters, uh, not just multiple characters and multiple names. So, for example, we have Zachary is Zoe, Franny, uh, Francis is Franny, but Franny also has another name that uh, Buddy calls her, or when, Zo when Zoe is pretending to be Buddy, he calls her Flopsy. And it, yeah, it's a sort of endearing but name that sort of connotes this clumsy behavior of her, that she is still a child, perhaps. Uh, Zoe refers to his mother as Fatty, unflatteringly, because he's trying to pass between, you know, the narrow hallway and he's telling her to move. Uh, and then, you know, Buddy... There's the capital B for Buddy, and then there's Buddy, something that Zoe calls Franny throughout the entire story, which is not only just maybe some sort of uh, interesting sort of subconscious thing that J.D. Salinger wants you to think, or the narrator in this case, about the relationship between the brother and the sister and Buddy, the actual brother that isn't there. But also as sort of like, I'm here to be your friend, as this term that buddy is, is used more and more generally in like a sort of a disarming way to make you feel a little bit more at ease. After that, we have dialogue. And in this case, I was going to use the word conversation, but dialogue is much more appropriate for stories and for play, right? For, for plays when you're reading a play. Uh, this is how they would use it. Um, I'm just going to change the color because this is quite interesting, I believe. And again, these are all my opinions, so please don't take anything as ab absolute fact. 
dialogue is in or, you know, how characters are discussing things and going on and on about their opinions can sometimes appear polemic sort of a, an attack or a criticism about one particular issue. Dialogue can also be seen as Socratic. When Zoe pretends to be Buddy calling Franny on the phone, it's no longer necessarily like, uh, here's what I think. It's more of, what do you mean? How does that make you feel? It's a very interesting switch, not only just character-wise, but dialogue, uh, dialogically wise, maybe dialogically. It refers to a slightly more complicated theme, but yet when we're thinking about discourse and dialogue, it does have a huge change right there. And uh, we also have this theme, irony. I'll put it there because there is this sense of dramatic irony when Zoe pretends to be Buddy. We know that he is. Nobody else knows until something, you know, he gives it away in some sort of... Um, uh, involuntarily, uh, which is quite quite interesting. And then the last section right here is smoking, because smoking appears so much throughout the story. If we go back to the beginning with Franny, Franny's in Franny's story smokes profusely, and I'll just say a lot. Who else smokes a lot? Her mother, Bessie. In the bathroom, she smokes a lot while she's talking to Zoe. Who else smokes a lot? <laughs> Zoe. Zoe smokes a lot when he's talking to Franny. Um, and a lot means they are constantly, they have a cigarette lit the entire time. Franny has one when she's talking to Lane in the first story. Franny has one in the second story with Zoe while she thinks she's talking to Buddy. Zoe has not just a cigarette, but a cigar, something that Franny despises, thinks it smells awful. Um, and it's mainly as... What's mentioned in the story later on is that, in a beautiful sort of meta way, Zoe, pretending to be Buddy, explains to Franny how the cigar that Zoe uses is a ballast or some sort of prop or something that is keeping him grounded. It's the only thing that he uses sort of like a talking stick or a type of prop. It's a beautifully comic thing. Um, and I'll just write here. Comical. There are certainly lots of lot, lot of parts of this story that are that are funny, although I would not call this story a, a comic story. It is a very heavy story. It talks a lot about family relationships and trust and chaos and panic and existential questions of life, religious questions. I highly recommend reading this story. You don't necessarily have to be familiar with American culture or American culture post-World War II. Um, there are numerous references that I would highly recommend uh, Googling or researching online. I did as well. Um, of course, I didn't cover everything in this video, but this is, a, I believe, a good start if you wanted to check out what a summary of the story is and just a general breakdown of like I have right above me over here the main themes that would pop up, let's say, if, I think if you were in a college class or a seminar discussing the story, this would give you a, a good grounding, a good start about where to move forward if you were going to write an essay about the story compared to Franny. I think that this would be handy. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, next story, next, uh, next literary review, next liter literature breakdown summary coming soon. Thanks so much for watching, and if you like this, please comment or please uh, uh, subscribe, like this video, share it with your friends. Thanks.